بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تباركت يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم ألهمنا مراشد أمورنا وأعذنا من شرور أنفسنا اللهم لك الحمد كما أنت أهله وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد كما أنت أهله وفعل بنا كما أنت أهله فإنك أهل التقوى وأهل المغفرة الله تبارك الله makes the month of Ramadan a month where a person who is searching for a certain light it is in this month that that light grows very very in a very unique manner it is the month in which many people who are far from Allah and they want to make the change. Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna lillahi lanafahat fi dahri. That in your zamana, in your time, you will definitely find there are certain times or certain minutes in which a certain wind from Almighty Allah blows. We call it the winds of mercy. Nafahat. Then he said, Ta'arradu laha. So if you know exactly or approximately when this will be happening, we know the last 10 nights of Ramadan, then we know the odd nights of Ramadan, then we know the 27th night. Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man qama Ramadan imanu wahtisaba Just standing in the taraweeh of the month of Ramadan every night. Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna li kulli sa'imin da'wa for every person who is fasting, there is one dua that is written for him that this is yours. Now when is the time for the dua? Nabi Sallallahu also made that clear. He said, فَإِذَا أَرَادَ أَحَدُكُمْ أَيْ يُفْطِرَ That when your intention is now I'm going to break the fast. So it means just before that, Kajur enters the mouth. Either the adhan has taken place or just before the adhan goes. That is that one. He said, when you're intending to break that fast, at that time make one dua. In this narration he mentioned, make the dua, Ya wasi'il maghfira. O oh, the one whose mercy is all-encompassing, Ighfirli, let it cover me also. Now me and you might think that mercy is a small thing. But mercy is a very, very big thing. This narration mentioned now that Allah got certain minutes where those winds blow. He said, so you will have to put yourself front for it. Put yourself front. He said, because that person who gets hit with even one of these nafahas, with one of these winds, la yashqa ba'dahu abada. After that, shaqawat. Shaqawat means wretchedness. Which Allah Tawarukullah speaks about. That faminuhum shaqiyu wa sa'id. That in the world, we have kept two groups of people. One is the one who is shaqi, that he has been written to be amongst those that are wretched. And then there are those that are sa'id, that they are most fortunate. If you are most fortunate, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, that there are those people in this world, that when you see them, it seems that they are doing the actions of the people of paradise. But because wretchedness had already been written for him while he was in the womb of his mother, he says, Taqdeer overtakes him. And just before he passes away, he commits an act which makes him from the people of the fire. This is called wretchedness. And the other, and for that person who it was written that he will find his path one day, just before dying, Allah Tabarukullah makes something happen. How to get that Saadat? This is what this narration mentioned. That there are certain winds that blow, you'll have to just push yourself front. So just before you break your fast, that's one time that say, Allah, let me not be wretched. Ya wasi al maghfira. Oh, the one whose mercy is all encompassing. What about me? Ighfirli. In whichever way you will make the dua. Sometimes you will think that like it's just a dua. But there's no just a dua. 
It is that dua that changes. Mahmoud Imran, when he compiled his kitab called Presence of Paradise, part 3. So in there he mentions two examples. He mentions an example of one where a baddua hits. You might think everything is running so well and the baddua, the curse, one day catches up. So it's a very long incident. There was a very great scholar of the past, Sheikh Ali Tantawi. He was a judge of his era and a very great khatib. So he wrote this. Perhaps it was in the 1980s or before that. He writes that he was traveling with his family when car came in front. That person was driving. Everyone was laughing in the car. And he was driving wild. And then he saw the car overtook them and carrying on moving side to side. And then he saw one truck that was turning. The truck was turning towards the right. And this car, he thought that before the truck makes the turn, he'll just manage to pass the truck. But it never happened. As the truck turned, it hit him slightly. And he was on an edge as it is. So with the hit of the truck, then that whole car moved to the side of the road and then went over. They looked at it. They saw the car tumbling down. Many cars stopped. He said they stopped, they went down, it took them about 20 minutes to get to the bottom. When they reached the bottom, they found that there was four people who were alive. There was one bigger girl and there was was smaller, two small children, one bigger girl and one woman. They were alive. And the other people in the car, they had passed away. Not only passed away, their bodies were in a very terrible state. He said it was amazing how these people came out and they were the younger of the group. And they came out like with hardly much scratches. And the ones that were left in the car, they was like there was hardly anything left of them also. Everything. So many people came, helped, moved these people away. Then they had to wait for the ambulance. He said he stayed a little extra because he was a judge. He was interested in knowing what's happening, who the people are, how can he help them. And he carried on. So he says after a while he asked like regarding this incident. And he said when the news came to him regarding it, then one sentence came out from his tongue. He said that, Wallah, O Allah, indeed you are the most just. And then he explained a very long incident. He said it started where one girl at a very young age, a proposal came. Her father said still too young. The other family said that even if she's young, she will come into our house like a daughter. We'll look after her. Our son really likes your daughter. We like her. And then the father was a great, like, he was not too happy, but he finally agreed. He was a very wealthy man. He looked after his daughter. She, she got married. And then he says, after she got married, life was not the same for the girl. It was a house she entered which was more miserly, stingy. In the house, there was one woman, meaning the father-in-law's sister. So because she was never married in life, So she never knew what it is to be married. So she couldn't allow her nephew and her niece-in-law to ever live like a married couple. She would always interfere. When she would see them getting too close, she would warn her nephew, you must never let a girl get so close to you. So she says in the house, she could never even be close to her husband. Her auntie would sit in the room till late. And she would just talk. She would like rule in that room. She couldn't complain to anyone because the father also, he respected his sister a lot. And he listened. He said at the beginning, the husband was really nice. It was just that the people around him, they never allowed him to spend time with his wife. If she wanted to go out also, she had to go out with them. All of them would go. And this is a complaint that sometimes some people in South Africa are making also. Boy and girl are getting married. And the girl is complaining that wherever we're going, my mother-in-law and father-in-law says, we also coming with. So he says that I have never been allowed to spend time with my husband at all. So for what reason the parents feel that the child is not yet ready to go alone, then they shouldn't get the child married. So same thing happened here. She never had, but she made sabr. Then they said in the house also, they were so stingy that if ever they bought anything like what we'll call biscuits, then they would put it in one drawer. And it would be like when one biscuit is taken, it's like someone's heart is coming out. That biscuits would only come out if visitors would come. And even then she says that when visitors would eat it, you would see my auntie-in-law looking at that packet of biscuits, like making dua, stop eating, stop eating. 
So he says, this was the house. She had come from a house where there was fruit every day. Here she never saw fruit. But she made sabr. Then the hard time came where now her auntie-in-law, her mother-in-law was also hard, stingy, but it was more the auntie-in-law. And the father would listen to her, so they started hating this girl. But the worst was when her own husband started hating her. Because so many thoughts the auntie-in-law would put in him, that he would be so happy outside the house. But because now his mind was made that to control your wife, you mustn't get too close. So when he would come home, he would be moody. And because of that day, she would also then respond in that manner. Whole day she used to be washing. There was no maid, she was the maid. But she made sabr for years. And then now the husband started not liking her. So this broke her. And then she fell shell pregnant. When you fall pregnant, you become weaker. You can't do exactly what you were doing. Now they became upset with her. And then they began telling the man, the boy, that this is not for you, this girl. And one thing it seems, the judge wrote, it seems they were scared about the expense of birth and the expense of looking after a newborn in the house. So they wanted now, they were not happy with the girl, they spoiled her life already, they wanted her out. But the only problem was that the meher that was written for the girl was a very huge amount and they had agreed to pay it. Because it was huge, it was made, one part was cash and one part will be paid afterwards. So that amount that had to be paid, they still never paid it still. And now if they were going to send this girl away and divorce her, they still had to pay that huge amount. So now they had to make a plan, how are we going to manage to get her to forgive this amount? And different ways they thought about, finally they latched on to this plan, that we need her to sign. She must sign that she had been given everything. So to do that there, they had to change their attitude towards her for a while. They had to say to her that, you know, recent next few weeks we'll be getting a lot of parcels and you're the only one who can write neatly. So you will have to sign on our behalf. And they began acting so nice whether she started taking a liking to them. And every parcel that's coming, she's just signing it, signing it. And then one day, then her mother-in-law rushes in and says, quickly sign this. And she's busy washing dishes, her hands still got soap. So she says, give me a time, I can at least see it. She says, no, you can see it later on, just sign it now, it's urgent. And she signed it. And that was that one document to show that I have com- taken my entire meher. So that was signed. Whatever was in the house, jehez they call it normally. You're getting married, the father gives for the daughter. So a lot of furniture was in the house. That day also when she got married, instead of taking furniture, they told the father that you send the money, we will buy what we feel appropriate for the house. So whatever they bought, they bought on their names. So there was no document to show he's the owner of it. Everything was theirs. Whatever happened, once they got that signature, then they made life very hard for the girl. And then the husband said, I don't want you anymore. And finally he dropped her off by her father's house. Her father was very upset at the beginning that we don't know divorce in our family. But when the girl spoke, explained, then everyone started crying. And then the father said, I will always look after you, don't worry. And then he asked now, that I want that meher that has not been paid to my daughter. And that's where they went to court for it also. When they went to court, whatever he asked for, they had papers for everything. So this is where the Sheikh Ali Tantawi is speaking. That even the lawyer said to the father, I can't understand, everyone knows this family is a liar. But how come the judge can't see it? So the father said that, I don't blame the judge. The judge is bounded by what is called what's on paper. He doesn't know the reality. So they lost the case. Then the lawyer wanted to fight it again, go to another court, higher court. Because everything was known. I mean, the girl said that she was made to sign it. She never even know. But how will the judge understand that? So that's when the father said that the judges of this world can err. But there is one judge that never makes a mistake. He said, I have handed this case over to that judge. So that happened. Then she gave birth. When the child reached about the age of seven. And everything was life was carrying on. That's when again this family came back. Now that man had already married. That woman also had her two small children. But for whatever when you have divorced. Then things are very like dirty. So after seven years they came back. To say we want custody of the child now. 
And they only wanted that child just to show a point to this girl, like to break her till the ending. So Sheikh Ali Tantawi writes, like again here they would win the case. There was no way they could manage to keep that girl. He says, so the day that they had to separate, it was only tears. But when the family came to fetch the child, for them it was mockery. He said, they looked at the father as in a mocking tone, like, that you will never manage to lay a finger on us. He said, they put that girl in the car. The girl was going to narrate what happened, this girl. Because when she went in the car, it was that first ride they were making. And in the ride, they were already mocking her mother in front of her. Like. So because everyone is one family and this poor girl, first time now she's... So they were driving and because this man was happy, I warned, like, I warned, I showed them a point, my father-in-law. Because he was in that happy mood, he was driving wild. That's the time when Sheikh Ali Tanfawi saw him driving. And while driving wild and, and that girl was like crying, the mother... And the girl in the car, she was also feeling so hurt that how they can say such things about her mother and her grandfather and grandmother. And while he was driving, then the turn was taking. And when Allah made it such that the decision was already made that the young girl is going back to her mother. You are not going to get that girl. So he said that car rolled from the top. Had that young girl died there, perhaps it would have been heart attack now for the mother. The car rolled from the top. But when it hit the bottom, he said, miraculously, whoever was innocent, Almighty Allah said, I want you all to come out of the car. So the wife, meaning the second wife, she had nothing to do with that old story. She also was thrown out of the car. And her two children were also thrown out of the car. And this girl here was thrown out. And all four of them were found with a few scratches. And those three people who Almighty Allah had a case with, he says, nothing ever passes by Almighty Allah. He said, their bodies were hit in such manners. It was not something you would want to see. So he says, then I remembered what that man had said. That I have put my case in a court where the judge never makes a mistake. So if shakawat is written for a person, wretchedness, it will find you even if you think you're winning the match. Somewhere along the line. You take someone's bad dua, someone's curse. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that curse will find you. He said, ittaqu Allah inayn. Stay away from the two things that curse a person. Mm. And they asked, what are those things? He mentioned that a person makes his istinja, he relieves himself, either on a public road or in the shade. What it meant is that in the deserts, a person looks for shade. He just one shade. He needs shade. Recently we went to one place. So that's when I mentioned this narration. So one person said, I want to fish. So we were tired. We reached the place. Now for me, it's I got no interest in fishing. So I'm going to look for a place where there's shade. Because the fisherman, he's not bothered to stand in the sun. But for me, now I got my kitab there. I'm going to stand and sit with him. So I'm looking around. I said, hey, there's one tree. That's the best place to cast your rod. So immediately we started. It was a nice walk to the tree. And when we reached the tree now, then right by the tree we realized that the sheep and the goats, they also like that spot. So it seems that they came there a while before and while they were drinking their water, they did their thing there. Just where I wanted to sit. Just there. Then I said, I had thought of this hadith. The only thing sheep and goats you can't curse. But when you reach there now and everything is dirty, then your heart like breaks. Like that couldn't the goat think of some other way to do its thing? Why he had to do it right here? So Nabi Sallallahu said, sometimes man doesn't think. And man wants to make istinja. So there's a whole desert to make istinja. But because he got what you call I care for none attitude. So he goes and he makes that istinja at the exact place where somebody else is going to need. So that traveler now who's so tired and then in the distance he sees that tree. And now he pushes that camel just a little bit further, a little bit further. And he's so tired and then he just reaches the tree. And when he reaches the tree, he sees someone's stool, someone's urine. At that time he doesn't know who did it. This narration was going to teach us lot laws. One is when you drive, think how you drive. 
Because sometimes you might take someone's curse. You might never ever know what happened later on. It might happen you did something which caused an accident behind you. But you carried on. So you were not scratched. No one knew, no one saw the number plate. You went, carried on. And for you it was, I just hope I don't get caught. But you must remember there's one court in this world, C-O-U-R-T, where the judge is bounded by what's on paper. And there's another court that takes place there. He said, Allah is most just. Never ever take the baddua of someone. Because Allah's Rasul said, when that curse comes out, it goes to the skies. Because it's not a dua, the skies do not want to accept it, so they make like a barrier. And they say, we do not take curses into the heavens. So it stops at the sky and then it turns around. When it turns around, it comes looking for the one against who it was sent. So it goes to him like what we will say, like a messile. When it comes to that individual, if it finds that he is deserving of the curse, then it will hit him. And it will spoil everything of his life. And if it finds he is not deserving of the curse, then it can't go to the heavens, it can't go to the person who you made the baddua against, then it will turn around and it will come back to the one who made the curse. The narration taught everyone, watch out about making badduas. If that man is not deserving, it's going to hit you back. And he taught the people, watch out for the curse of the oppressed. Because between him and Allah, there's no barriers. He says, on that day I saw it, that Allah, Allah, your justice. And at the end of his book, Presence of Paradise, he gave another incident. The incident of what dua can do for a person. So in that incident he says one person at night in the lands of Arabia he sees a dream where he is told that this phone number you must phone this number and take this person for Umrah. So he wakes up for him it's like a strange dream who's going to phone a person and say come let's go for Umrah. So he doesn't worry about it but the next night he sees the same. So then he tells one scholar one alim so the alim says Leave it, but if you see it one more time, three is like regarded as yaqeen, conviction, three. If you see it one more time, then as soon as you wake up, write that number down. And then phone the person because it seems then Allah wants you to take this man for Umrah. So that night he sees it again. Phone this number and take the man for Umrah. He remembers the number, he writes it down, now he phones. He doesn't know who he's talking to. He says, my name is so and so, I live in here. I have been told in a dream like, to invite you for Umrah. Normally you will think if you tell someone that on a dream, that man will say like, Hooray! Like, Hooray. One friend, we were discussing something about scams. You get scams. They phone you and then they say, you know what, congratulations, you won. And normally as soon as you see that, we know we never won. Because no one gets lucky. So immediately we just write this spam. So he got a phone call to say that, you know what, what you call it, I don't know, it's called FNB e-box. So he said, you want e-box. So we just need to like confirm. So immediately like, he said, hey, I'm very busy, sorry, sorry. If you want to, you can phone me after three hours. And he said, after three hours, phone call came again. So now he told the person that, you see, like I can't, I'm not giving no information over the phone. If you want to email me. So the person on that side said, Sir, I can't email you. We don't work with this email system. On the phone I need it. And it's carrying on for a while. And that person is saying, Sir, I'm telling you, you won. And he is saying that, you know, I'm not falling for this trick again. So finally the person said, Okay, go on to your account. Your account. And you must go on to this one part here and you will see there that you won. It's on your account. So then he went on to it. So he said when he opened that then he saw how much he won. So he won 45,000 rands. So he was so thrilled. He told that man, sir, even if you want to know the color of my underwear, I'll tell you also. <laughs> because when you win, you score heavy. <laughs> I'll tell you anything you want to know. 
just put the thing in, <laughs> anything. So it was like, when you're winning something, then you take it all. You're not bothered if you're winning. So this person now, normally you'll phone a man and say, Umrah. And the man will jump like, and say, where you are? How can I come? But this man on the other side, he never, he laughed. And he said, me and Umrah. Like, you're making a joke. So this person is begging him that, see, don't put the phone down. Because I got a job to do. I know you don't want to come for Umrah. But I got a job. Let me do my job. So then, after a while, this man said, you know, me, I don't know what Umrah you're talking about. I don't even read Salah. And he just went quiet. And for a while, then the man, the other said, okay, told him, okay, on condition, you come and fetch me from my house. You take me for this Umrah, what you're talking about, and you bring me back. You leave me exactly, and I'm not going to spend one real in this issue. He said, I live here in Riyadh. I imagine right in Riyadh. But forget Umrah, he never performs Salah also. So this man makes the trip. He's so like excited, he's going to fulfill his dream. But when he comes there, he finds a man who's what we call a drunkard. So immediately he puts you off, like, must I waste my money on this guy? And it's not easy to travel with a drunkard. Like He got his own talk, his own way. But thinking of the dream, he puts him, they go. This man says, Gee, I don't know anything of this Umrah. You're going to do it, I'm just going to follow you. And they make that Umrah. He puts him in the Ihram, he tells him, read this, read this. He makes the whole Tawaf. They make the Sa'i, everything is finished. Now the man wants to go back. But just before the man going back now, this man says to him, okay, hold on. I want to read two rakat. Because I don't know if I'll ever make this Umrah thing again. Like, when me and you normally will say that, I'm there, Allah, let me come back. This is a man like that. He said, I don't know if I'm coming back here. So two rakats and then we go. He said, no problem. So this man is now making the two rakats, but now he's not finishing the two rakats. And this person is now getting little because he told the taxi also, at a certain time you'll be ready. Everything is booked. Now this man is in sajda not coming up. Now he don't want to go tell the man that now you're overdoing it. But waiting, 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 finally he had to go and tell the person that, you know, that booked taxi is going to start getting irritated. And as he's touching the person, he finds the person passed away. He's in sajda and he passed away. So he was amazed. So now immediately he had to tell the can- taxi cancel everything and the janaza had to take place. So he says he was so like, you, what you call, shocked at this. When he saw that the ghusl was taking place and they even brought zamzam. Because now you're being buried there. And he was buried there in the haram. So he said like what a ghusl, what a burial. And then in the haram your janaza namaz is taking place. So he took part in all that. And he's thinking like how amazing this thing is. What a man like. No namaz in his life. No salah. So then everything is finished. Now he goes back. The family is informed. And after about one or two weeks he phones the wife like that he wants to come also with his family for tasalli. Because he went and fetched the person. And at the same time, now he wants to find out from this woman that what a lovely death your husband had. So he must have had some action in his life. That in the ending, imagine a phone call had to be made. In the dream, phone this number. He must die in the haram. So when he asked this woman, like, what was it? So she says that he was a man who loved drinking. He drank before sleeping and he drank as soon as he woke up. Meaning you call it all the time you drank. Before sleeping, he said the bottle was on the side of the bed. He drank and then he slept away drunk. And he drank as soon as he woke up. So always drunk. He said, if you look for a good action in his life, I don't think of anything. The most I will say to you is at night, after he would buy his drinks from wherever he would buy it and coming home, then as coming home, he would also stop at one shop to buy groceries. So the groceries would come because now it's the only time he's really sober. And he's going to go drunk again now. So he would buy groceries. And in the groceries he would always buy one packet also for one family that was a widow and the children, meaning the orphans. There was one family on the street. So he would buy one small parcel for them. Then he would knock at that door, leave the thing there. Sometimes they would open up and take it. Sometimes he would come home and tell me, they just contact that family. 
and tell them I left it by the gate, they must take it in. He says, whenever I would phone that woman, that woman would say this. She would say, first, Jazakumullah khair, may Allah reward you all. And then she would say, Allah yuhsinu khatima. That may Allah make his end very unique. Allah yuhsin khatima. Like how Arabs normally will speak. Allah make his end very good. And then he said it was this one dua. One woman making a dua that perhaps he never heard because he was always drunk. If anyone made amin to the dua, it was his wife. He never heard the dua. But one dua went up. And it was going to make changes in the heavens. One dua was going to bring a phone call. In a dream, phone this. Make sure you phone this. Make sure you phone this. One dua was going to take a man to the haram. One dua was going to get him washed with zamzam. One dua. So this is called Allah got certain moments in life. And you have to push yourself for those moments. We don't know where it is, but we will look for what is called mazanna. Mazanna, I think it's here. I think it's there. When the imam between the two khutbas just sits. He gave the khutbah. Then the imam sat. It was only about 30 seconds or 15 seconds and then he stood. That 15 seconds is one of these. Mavanna. That I think this is that time. At that moment you can't make dua with your lips moving. You will make dua in your heart. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, on the day of Jumu'ah, there is that time that moves. He said, grab that time. Because whatever dua is made in that time, there is no barrier between it and the arsh of Almighty Allah. Sahaba radiallahu would now say, what is that time? According to some of them, that just before Maghrib, just before Maghrib. So in one narration, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, that whichever servant is found performing salah at that moment. So Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As, he said it's just before Maghrib. So a student said, but the narration said found performing salah. You can't perform salah at that time. And here between the khutbah, you can't be performing salah at that time. So Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As explained that the meaning of this found performing salah, in this narration salah means dua. There is that moment that comes on a Juma, Whichever individual is found at that moment in dua, then there is no barrier between him and his. He got it. Now it's Ramadan. Ramadan got at different times. But tomorrow you are going to get that Juma. For the men, for the boys, you will get the time between the imams. One khutbah, first khutbah and second. The woman will not be able to find that time. But before the Maghrib Salah, you can definitely get it. Then the narration had said, every person who is fasting, inna li kulli sa'imin da'wah, for every person fasting, there's a dua. That's every night. But now imagine that one that's on a Juma, what we will call Friday, just before Maghrib. Because that one, that's possible of that first narration. That on the day of Juma there is that moment. Then it is that you're breaking your fast, that itself. And then we are in Ramadan. So that's a dua that you must not miss. But your hands are up, or you can't put up your hands because in both your hands you got already something to eat. So your hands are full. But dua is a thing of the heart. It must not be the grasam. Like just like I'm reading something I don't know. It must be like how that woman was saying, Allah, make his end good. And one her sentence and what he did. So you at that moment must also be saying. If you know Arabic, you will say it with feeling, Ya wasi'al maghfira. Oh, the one whose mercy is so unique, what about me? Ighfirli. Or if you don't know, you will just say in English, Allah, make my day and my night, my loving and my death, everything unique. Allah, let me never see a difficult time in this world, in the qabr, in the year after. Allah, make me the best of all the worlds, whatever you want to make. Everyone knows something. When Ramadan started, someone asked for advice. 
So I said, I normally give advice when a person is going for Umrah, for Hajj. I say, you are going to the land of Dua. You are going to the land of Dua. It must not happen you come back from that land. And when we ask what Dua you made, then you just say, no, I made Dua. But you ask, like what? And you say, like what you mean, like what? means he doesn't know what he asked for. So if you don't know what you ordered from take a lot, you will not be checking up every now and then, did they send the order? Because you yourself don't know what you ordered. You will just say, no, at night I was playing around, I think I ordered, maybe I never ordered, maybe I saw the price, yeah, I don't know. That man is going to get nothing. The one who ordered, at night already he's thinking, is it coming tomorrow? Tomorrow no one is knocking. As soon as he hears a hoot, I say, I think it's take a lot. And if it's not, he goes back to phone and he says, what about this? A man comes back from that land and he doesn't know what he asked. It means he really never make any dua. So what we mention is that one is your normal duas. You got munajat and makbul, you got hizbul azam, you got your duas you learned in madrasa. And one is your set dua. Set dua means every year our needs change. Every month our needs change. When the time of dua or the place of dua is coming, you must take a few duas. Maximum three, which is called my duas for this Ramadan. Now you already think well about it. Don't go make some small funny kind dua. You will think of a top dua. Previously, most likely I mentioned, Hazrat Muhammad Abdul Hamid Sab Damud Barakatu says, the man who never knew how to make dua. When he was told, you got three wishes, he rubbed that pot, the jinn came out. So the jinn told him, three wishes, he got so shocked. He wasn't ready, like what to wish for. And his wife was in front. And at the moment, at that day, there was nothing in the fridge. So a woman, when there's nothing in the fridge, she don't want to hear about anything. She's angry, why there's nothing in the fridge. So the jinn came out, he said three wishes and no wishing for more wishes. We so only got three like. Before he could say anything, she said, I wish there's paloni in the fridge. Because no breakfast. So immediately paloni is fast, fast. You just go to Khan's and you get it. So for the jinn, no problem. The paloni was there immediately. For the husband, it was my wish and one paloni. Like you wasted my wish for a paloni. He got so angry, he said, I just wish this baloney gets stuck on your nose. And suddenly, he got his wife there with a the baloney. Now two wishes are gone. Now what's your last wish going to be? The last wish is, okay, please let the baloney come back on the plate. Now when they're eating that baloney, how they'll feel? You wasted your life for a baloney. That's what it is. <laughs> So when you're going to make your du'as, don't hit small things. Ask for big things. You choose three du'as maximum. And after that you can make any other du'a. Whether you're going for Umrah, you're going for Hajj, Ramadan is coming, the time of du'a. So you must say, this is my three. I got my three. So when I'm going to make the three? I'm going to make it whenever I find the time of du'a. Same three, immediately. It's like natural on my tongue. I'm going to say it so many times that at the end of Ramadan when Eid comes, I'm going to be asking Allah that I know what I asked for. I want to see it delivered. So when is the time of dua? As soon as my mother wakes me up for seri. As soon as I hear that clock ringing. Some people set three clocks in their house. The first clock they set it so it gives them extra 20 minutes to sleep. That people love that one the most. They set it like 20 minutes, half an hour extra. So you put it off and then you say, Eh, I still got half an hour. So now you're not going to wake up, but you already awoke. Soon as your eyes open, you make your three duas and then you go back to sleep. But don't let the three duas time go. So I hit my three duas because I know my three duas. I know what it is. So I made it there. Then when the real alarm clock went on, again I made my three duas. Because now I'm tired. Whether I'll read two rakats, tahajjud or not, I don't know. But my three duas, I already put it. Now I sit for my seri, 
Time is running short. I'm quickly reading two rakats, the hajjud, whether I'm getting in or not. But before that, I already made my three duas. After my three duas, I can add any other dua. But my three duas, I'm not letting go. During the day, whenever I'm feeling hungry, my three duas. And like this. Now, asr time comes after every salah. Nabi Sallallahu said, after every salah, dua is accepted. My three duas. Because in Ramadan, even more, I'm fasting. Now, asr time comes. Now, the thing is so severe, the hunger. My mother says, make dua. Father says, make dua. Husband says, make dua. I got no strength to make dua. I just want the muazzin to say, Allahu Akbar. But my three duas are short. Three duas. Tarawih time is coming between my four rakats and four rakats. Because after every four rakats, there's a slight gap. You have to wait a little. My three duas. So between every four rakats, I got my three, got my three, got my three. Tarawih finished my three. In the day, how many times I made my three duas? Too many times. One day I made it so many times. You must make it so much that you will feel after that while I'm sleeping also I'm making that dua. While I'm sleeping. This is how it is called, Nabi Wasallam said, continue persisting with Almighty Allah. It's called Israr. Israr means when you want something from your father, your mother, and they don't want to give it. They're normally boys and girls. Girls are better in this than boys. They know how to get what they want. They will ask it in how many ways, in how many manners. They will say it in a nice smiling manner. Then they will cry and then they'll say it. Then they'll remind again the next day. Remind. They'll be told so many times, no. But if you know how to get your thing, that word is called israr, persist. Nabi Sallallahu said, persist with Almighty Allah for what you want. He says, because no one can ever force Allah. Allah in the ending, He can't be like, I'm forced. But Allah is Allah. So he says, don't ever think that you say, no, I don't want to force you, O oh Allah. Allah can't be forced. Your father and mother, that's what you're supposed to say, that mommy, I don't want to force you. I know it's difficult, but by Allah, nothing is difficult. So he said, you can't ever like force Allah. You can't do something that, Allah, I think it's difficult for you. Okay, I don't want to push. He said, no, by Allah, push, because nothing is difficult for Allah. You ask, you ask, and you will see somewhere the results of your dua. As you ordered it will come. Or better than what you ordered will come. Or Allah will use it to push away so much of harm from you. Lot of things with dua. The month of Ramadan is the month of dua. Grab it, don't lose it. Grab it, don't lose it. Our three duas. And one more advice for the month of Ramadan is, in this month, Almighty Allah pushed away the shaitan. The most rebellious of the shayatin. Other small ones are out. Iblis also, he doesn't get locked up till Qiyamah. So he is always moving around. But the rebellious, faulty, terrible shayatin. Allah Tabarukta pushed them one side in the month of Ramadan so that the environment becomes much more easier. For what? So for many people it will be for ibadah. Some will say for Quran. Some will say for dua. Really what it is for is to prepare for the day when the rebellious shayateen are let loose. Ramadan is a preparation for the next attack. So many people who don't know this here, in Ramadan they start reading Lord Quran. They become pious. There are those people who say that TV in Ramadan, I don't watch. But they don't make toba from TV. So they see which movies they like. And then they set that thing, automatic tape. Now that's just in the past. Nowadays it's not even like that. Nowadays everything's on YouTube. So he says, okay, I won't watch it in Ramadan, I'm pious. But after Ramadan, now I know I have to check out this one, this one. I've got a lot of kada to make up. So that person said Ramadan is a month of piety and after Ramadan is let loose. It wasn't supposed to be like that. It was that the government caught some criminals. And the South African government made it known that these people were thinking of torching the whole Indonesia. So we managed to control it. We grabbed them. We imprisoned them. But it might be that other Groups are making arrangements for after this month. And even these, because South African prisons got a lot of holes. 
Every now and then you'll read the prisoners escaped. So even these, you don't know how long they're going to be in prison. But the news was given that why don't you all prepare for an attack. So everyone now in Lanesia starts getting ready. Every house starts preparing. The woman of the house who said, I don't like guns at all. She suddenly is also at the shooting range. She never wanted a child to touch a gun. The child is shooting. Father is shooting. Everyone is shooting. Guns are being bought. Legal, illegal, everything is coming. So much preparation is made. And then just when the month is over and the government announces that, you know what, those criminals we caught, they escaped. And now it's known they're going to go meet those other ones who are already planning. At that time, the husband comes home and he says, gather all the guns, all the ammunition, take everything and we're giving it away. So everyone in the house will say, we prepared for what then? Ramadan was to prepare for the attack of the rebellious shayateen. That man is not prepared who reads lot of Quran in Ramadan. And as we're reaching the ending, then we see our car, petrol is getting less. And now we start getting more tired, more tired. 27, I made my khatam. I'm say, I'm so happy. 28, I'm not even reading. I'm relaxed. 29, relaxed. Eat day the most relaxed. And after eat, very relaxed. And you ask the man that you read so much Quran in Ramadan for what? He said, no, I read for the whole year. He said, Ramadan's Quran was not for that. Ramadan's Quran was to make your tongue accustomed to Quran. Because when that rebellious shayateen will launch the attack after Ramadan, our only protection against them is this Quran. And in every year, the attack of the shayateen is getting worse. And we have reached a stage in life which is called another boost of the shayateen. Perhaps the world saw one boost which was called with the opening of the internet. That was called one khuruj of the devil. One unique emergence of the devil when the internet started in the world. You all perhaps won't even know it started. You all will think it was always there. But there was a time where there was no internet. We saw that time. What internet opened up to the world, you will call it a burst of the shaitani powers. They were able to bring everything into the house. Everything into the pocket. They brought the phone, they brought the Facebook, they brought the chats, they brought the WhatsApp. Marriages broke. Things that people never thought would ever happen in houses happened. So we went through that patch. Now we're reaching a time where there's another boost of shaitani power. It will take place now because COVID was like that spring for it. And after COVID and this war of Russia and Ukraine, you will see such things opening up in the world. One of those things is what is known as the metaverse. That's only one but. There will be these mega cities, these new cities, Neom will be one. We will see that. And in each one, one bayan or hundred bayans will never do justice to the evil in that. That metaverse, when it will be put on, it will make a man who's in his dying moments also. They're telling him, read kalima, he don't want to let go of that thing. He'll die with that thing on. What drugs and what alcohol makes a man's mind go out of pain. The metaverse will take your mind out of pain. The boy will just come home, girl will come home, put it on. And they'll be in another world. They can stay in that world for hours. They can sometimes, if no one wakes them up, stay in that world for days also. In that world, they will think they're eating, they will think they're drinking. They will not worry about real food, real drink. You might say, can't happen this year. But already with the normal phone, we see hours that boy goes, just touching, 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 chatting, chatting, chatting. But the metaverse is not just you chat. Your body will be feeling that. It will be more real than the real world. More real than the real world. 
He mentioned this in one place that while this thing was still being produced like in different experiments in China and Japan, they always ahead. So one of those programs, one Chinese couple, they were arrested because their child passed away while they were both engaged in this what is called a new world. It came to court. The judge asked them that couldn't you hear the child crying? The child died because of hunger. Husband never heard the child crying. Wife never heard. Mother and father both became oblivious to a child. That was just the beginning. Now when the metaverse comes, you'll become oblivious to yourself, to your deen. Even if a man is dying and they're telling him, read kalima, he don't want to let go of that thing. No, I'm not dying. I'm okay, I'm okay. And he'll die. That's only one of the coming future. When the devil after Ramadan will launch his attack worse. Ramadan came for me and you so that what Quran I was reading last year, it has to become more. Because my Quran has to increase with the increase of fitan. When their evil goes higher, my Quran must go higher. As long as I got Quran with me and wudu, it will be my shield. So in this month of Ramadan, one is I ask you, you make dua. And your main dua from your three was that Allah let me not be those that are wretched. In any way you want to make it. Allah make me from the fortunate. Saeed. Allah make me from the people of Jannatul Firdos immediately. So then you safe already. No hisab. Whatever dua you want to make to protect your akhirat. That it must not happen we love this world and we lose it at the end. Wretchedness must not come to us. Ya wa'si'il maghfira ikhfiri. So you make your three du'as and you persist in this month. Persist. And with your Quran you prepare that when the devil is going to launch his attack after Ramadan, I am ready for him. I got so much Quran, it's on my tongue now. Before my Zohar I read so much pages. After my Zohar I read, so my Zohar is sorted out. After my Asr, before my Asr, Three pages this side, three pages that side. My Maghrib, three pages this side, three pages that side. During my day, I got my amount of Quran. Ramadan must prepare us. That after Ramadan, my amount of Quran must be a good amount. So whatever your attack is going to be, my Quran is going to push it all away. Allah, tabarakallah, through the barakah of Ramadan, through the blessings of dua, through the blessings of Quran, Allah put us all in His unique shield, in His unique power, we are the warriors of the future. But the warrior himself must never forget his weapons. If he hasn't got his weapon, forget protecting others. He's not going to protect himself. If you got your weapon with your dua, with your Quran, you will be able to make a shield that will surround you and you will be able to make it bigger to surround your families, to surround your friends. Your Quran can go very far. Very far. But first you must have your own Quran. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين